In this episode, you're going to learn what to do when you run up against the person holding the Excel sheet in your organization. You're going to learn how to show the impact of your work as a service designer. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, uh, my name is Joyce. This is the Service Design Show, episode 125. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. On this show, we try to look what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you design services that make a positive impact on people and business. The guest in this episode is Joyce Yi. She's a professor of design and social innovation at the School of Design at the North Umbria University. If you've ever struggled to explain the value of your work, you're not alone. This is one of the biggest challenges in the service design community at this moment. Joyce is one of the people who has developed a framework that helps designers to show the impact of their work. And all while staying true to the emergent nature of design, where the fact is that value is created at times and in places and in forms which you didn't expect upfront. If you stick around till the end of the episode, you'll learn how this framework works and how you can use it in your work to show the value of design, even if you're currently in a context driven by short-term and quantifiable results. Now, while you're here, make sure to click that subscribe button if you haven't done so already and click that bell icon to be notified when new conversations like this come out. And that happens every two weeks. Now, it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Joyce Yi. Welcome to the show, Joyce. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing very well. It's a lovely day in the Netherlands, uh, so I'm really looking forward to having this chat with you. Uh, for the people who don't know who you are, could you give a 30-second introduction? So my name is Joyce. I'm a professor of design and social innovation in the school design at Northumbria University. We're based up in the northeast of England, uh, in the UK, um, and I've been working um, as a design educator and researcher for the past 15 years, uh, mainly looking into teaching um, interaction design, service design, and social innovation. Mm. And I think you have a special relationship with uh, a guest that has been on the show not so long ago, Emma Jeffries. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, Emma and I go back a long way. We've been friends for since she started doing her uh, PhD at the School of Design. And we got to know each other and basically ended up writing two books together. Um, so yeah, so she's, uh, she's been my kind of partner in crime in a lot of the work that we've done so far. Hmm. Uh, the episode with Emma, we talked about empathy at work. We're going to discuss a different topic, uh, today. Uh, I think mm -hmm. just as interesting, um, before we dive into the conversation, I want to do a 60 second rapid fire question round with you. Uh, the okay. idea is that you answer these five questions as soon as, as quickly as possible. Uh, don't overthink them. So, okay. um, ready? Yep, ready. Okay. Question number one, what's always in your fridge? Um, coconut juice. Coconut juice. Uh, question number two, which book are you reading at this moment? Um, I've started lots of books. I haven't finished it, but at the moment I'm reading one on trying to read uh, outdoor clues and sign. I'm a keen hiker, so uh, it's interesting to understand how trees grow and read the landscape. Mm. I will add a link in the show notes to that book. Uh, <laughs> yes. Which superpower would you like to have? I would love to fly. Um, I um, <clears throat> I love to to watch birds of prey, and I'm just amazed at how much they can just soar without any um, any you know, required energy, and they can just see the world very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. The next question is, what did you become, what did you want to become when you were a kid? Um, definitely not a doctor, because I, I think I faint on the side of blood. I don't, I don't quite remember. I think actually very early on, I wanted to be a designer, very oddly enough. So, mm. 
maybe I've just I've just been obsessed with it from young. Oh, good for you! <laughs> you met your yeah. maybe quite sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. Well, finally, the question, uh, final question is: When did you first hear about service design? Um, actually, uh, when it really first came out, I think probably ten years ago or more than that. I remember the Design Council uh, had a, a promoted festival here, Design of the Times, uh, 2007, actually more than 10 years ago. And, and they were bringing together, uh, I guess, what you might call very early service design agencies and working with the community in the Northeast. Um, and I also have another good friend, Lauren Tan, who worked on the first book that Emma, did, Emma and I did. And she did um, probably one of the first... PhD on that and looking to sort of design methodologies used in, in, in the projects that was part of the design at the time. So actually very early on, and I was working with people like um, Professor Robert Young, who was quite early on theorizing the topic area. So um, I was in, I was, yeah, so I was aware of it quite early on. Mm. Mm. Cool. Um... Joyce, we're going to touch upon a topic. I, we did a sort of uh, preparation call, as I do with all my guests, and we get we went over a list of what might be interesting topics mm -hmm. to discuss. And we had uh, quite a big list. And I said, I think there's one topic that would really be interesting for our audience. Sure. We're going to talk about how to evaluate uh, social impact. Right, that's uh, one of the areas mm -hmm. that you're passionate about. I think there's a lot to explore. One of the most mm -hmm. common questions I get is how do I sort of prove the value of my work? Mm -hmm. How do I measure yeah. the value of my work? How do I convince other people that it's actually working? So I think there's still a lot of mysteries that um, need to be unraveled. You've done a lot of research around this. So uh, that's the topic uh, for this episode. But before, we're going to dive into that. I'm really curious, how did you get on this journey and how did you get interested in figuring out how to evaluate social impact? Yeah, so I guess from a personal practice point of view, um, I've been involved in delivering some service design projects quite early on. So uh, one of the projects that we were involved in, in involved um, turning a kind of traditional face-to-face work-based training program for, for a company in the Northeast into completely an online digital service. Um, and this was very early in 2010. And th the project was hugely successful. You know, by the end of the project, they managed to convert all their face-to-face -face learners onto this digital platform that not only enhanced the way they were delivering the, 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 the program, but also helping you know a lot of cost efficiency in terms of not having to travel and for the advisors and the trainers to face to face and all that so as well i mean they're still doing that it wasn't replacing it but it was much more efficient and then they were you know able to kind of manage all the documentation online so we knew it was successful from a i suppose business point of view uh cost savings efficiency but we also knew that it helped improve the learner's experience so we ended up um, wanting to do an evaluation on the the, the benefits, the social benefits of of this service, um, and we at that time, you know, decided, okay, well, let's what are the kind of evaluation methods out there, and and it's you know what's like design is really hard to quantify in, in terms of the benefits and outcomes. So we ended up finding this um, method called social return on investment um, SROI. So it's like return on investment, but with an S at the at the front, you know, adding a social. So we thought, oh, that's perfect. You know, it's an established uh, way of evaluation. The business people will get it. They'll understand it. So, and we try to use this methodology. I mean, it's quite an involved methodology. You almost, actually, you have to be officially trained to, to use it. We almost kind of did it like um, guerrilla style, you know, kind of learned about it and <laughs> ended up trying, just trying it out as a, as a test, really. Um, and we got the organization aboard and, and they were really happy to do this. But it ended up, Really, it just felt it didn't really quite work out. I think it was because the fundamental um, way SROI works is that it offers, it gives a financial proxy to a um, to an outcome. So trying to quantify some, you know, like um, 
cost savings of journeys. Like how much would that say? Yes, you can save on fuel, but what about um, uh, reduced pollution, better health, well-being, for example? It's very hard to, you can find some proxies, but there are also a, a lot of overlapping proxies. So how do you avoid double counting in the kind of accounting speak? So that's the fundamental way in which we did. We found it very challenging, very hard to really pinpoint exact benefits. And so we ended up just, we did it, but, and we, it did tell us certain things. Um, but actually a lot of those, those, those insights really came from interviews and sort of um, long form narrative and understanding what has changed rather than trying to quantify that into a financial proxy. So that was the start. And we, I kind of, you know, learned a lot from that and realized it just wasn't doing what we needed to do. And, and then how I ended up now focusing in much more on this space is because uh, my research is really around working with uh, designers who support social innovation initiatives and mainly around um, the Asia Pacific region because I'm originally Malaysian um, and I still have lots of links there and I'm really interested in the region in terms of how design is being used now light in the West to, to deliver innovation. And so when we spoke to a lot of practitioners there, um, you know, just to find out what they do and what their practices are. You know, a lot of the challenges that they keep talking about is social impact and particularly around social innovation. You know, the main thing, the main outcome is about um, improving people's lives, imp giving social benefit. But of course, they come, come across the same kind of issue that I personally uh, uh, have, you know, uh, encountered, which is how do you meaningfully evaluate social impact? Mm. Yeah. And uh, even... I think it's good to address that even though we're talking about social impact and maybe social innovation, a lot of the same challenges apply in the world of service design. So I think it's, in a lot of cases, it's almost interchangeable. Yeah. Um, one thing uh, that I noticed from reading your stories and reading your research is the, the word evaluating rather than mm. something like measuring the impact. I think it's a subtle difference, but it makes it makes it makes a lot of difference, right? Can you mm. elaborate on that a little bit, like evaluating versus measuring? Yeah, actually, we used the term evaluation because I guess in the parlance of the sector, it's quite common. So in um, uh, international development programs or, or social programs, for example, so they often you often hear the term monitoring and evaluation. M and E. So M and E in itself is a beast in itself. So they often have a, an external partner that does an M and E on a, uh, a program, um, and then is not done externally. So M and E is a a used term. We don't like the idea of monitoring. So we thought, oh, okay, well, evaluation is actually what they know. So and this is the term that is used by the practitioner. So we went with that. Um, but I also think that even the term evaluation has a lot of baggage with it because it, it is linked to this idea of measurement. It is linked to this idea of monitoring, you know, making sure that the money that you've given to the community is used properly and, you know, not being, um, you know, wasted away. So there is a lot of baggage relating to simply because historically that's the term and that's the function of trying to um, make sure that the money is, because obviously a lot of these funding is either coming from government or uh, private philanthropy, and they have a board of directors and they want to know where the money goes and whether it's of good use or not. So that's uh, why we've used evaluation, but we've also used it to um, change this idea of uh, moving away from monitoring and assessment so much. So mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I'm learning with each and every episode of the show that there are new areas that I know nothing about, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> one of the questions that I had was, what kind, yeah, what kind of limitations are there to existing ways of evaluating? Like, why did you set out to find a better framework? So, a lot of the m and &E, or monitoring evaluation models that are being used, is very similar to the SROI that I mentioned, which is pretty much set up as an assessment tool. Um, it's also based on accounting model. So, you know, putting financial proxies to, to outcomes. Um, what is and, a financial proxy? 
So, for example, um, if one of the outcomes is to improve uh, or increase the um, number of children going to school and finishing school, so you would um, you would then put a financial proxy to that. So if they were to be kept in school and then to, to leave, they would um, have get better jobs and the jobs will give them 200% more than what they were earning if they didn't have school. So it was, it was trying to kind of give those proxies to those outcomes when actually what what is more meaningful is that if they stay in school longer, yes, they might have an opportunity to get a better job, but it might mean that they have children at a, a later age they're not forced into forced marriages and the, you know and they're not then so the, all these are really hard you, you can't quantify that so i think that's also the, the challenge so a lot of the what we call the traditional or dominant way of event not i wouldn't say all evaluations like that there are a subset of evaluation methods that does take into account these um longer term uh, social outcomes but the majority that is used, and the one that is probably used because it's quite easy, is um, a lot of it's quant, it's like qu- quantitative, you know, measuring number of people in the program, uh, increased income, uh, participation, all that sort of thing. So things that we know is easy to measure, and is easy to measure at the end of a program. But a lot of these evaluation don't doesn't often, unless you have a lot of budget, you can't go back six months, a year, two years after to look at the outcome. And we know actually social outcomes take a lot longer to develop over the, you know, some could be five years, some could be 10 years. So that's some of the challenges and but also the reason why I think we were very keen to um, change the conversation as well from, you know, what we hear from the practitioners is the challenges to evaluate and the stress as well because they have been told by the funders they have to evaluate these and they, they may not have the capacity or the capability uh, to to do the kind of evaluation expected to be reporting at you know board level funding level, so it also puts pressure on the practitioners and they feel that sometimes the criteria that is being asked to be evaluated by the funders, which is set like miles away in some sort of boardroom or in you know by or practitioners who who do cross national cross international programs, they want to do some cross comparison, so they set a, a baseline. But it doesn't quite work for the community, specific community. So they, they also find that the criteria they're being asked to evaluate doesn't quite match what they think is coming out of it. So they get frustrated that, well, why aren't they looking at this? And why aren't they looking at this? So the num- so um, the model isn't working quite well for the, especially in the way, if you're using sort of a more design approach, you know, very emergent and you, you don't know what you're going to find out, you, you don't have an outcome, we, you know, you, you believe in the process, but you don't know what you can you can estimate you can hypothesize what outcomes, but you, it might not come out. So it doesn't fit the model. First of all, secondly, it it's not equitable. It's someone on the outside telling us what we've done well, what we haven't done well, and that's very disempowering for the practitioners and the communities. Um, and it's um, it doesn't quite often capture what needs to be captured because they're probably measuring the wrong things. Mm. I, I so feel the pain. I've been in so many situations <laughs> where this was the case and the challenge with services is that there are systems and systems are really hard to to measure on an individu- individual touch point level. You mm-hmm. sort of have to observe the system and then it becomes really complex to act- mm. to measure all the side effects and side benefits uh like you said yeah. measurements are set yeah. out um or standards are set from uh outside it sounds like um it, it sounds like a lot of challenges uh and um if we go back like w- what have you found to be the some of the root causes is it because it's easy to measure people at the top are trained this way like what's What's preventing us from adopting a different way of uh, understanding success? I think it's the same kind of challenge that that a lot of um, designers face when they're trying to help an organization be more people-centered or more design-led, right? So there's this one way of doing business, which is very bottom line and seeing kind of 
processes and outcomes, but not seeing the human dimension of it. It's the same thing here, you know, international development, um, certainly at kind of, if it's sort of top down level, they just see it as uh, programs, but they don't actually, programs that need to be, you know, defined and has all these processes in place and methods in place. And they don't quite think about that. In, I mean, it's, it's mindset, it's, it's a way of thinking, I think, but also um, it's also very hard. It takes a lot of time and money <laughs> to do it in that sense. If you were to, for example, really evaluate and really look at the outcomes, you know, um, you do need the, the, the resources to do that. Um, but also uh, the framing of this is idea that, um, that we do need to have some sort of um, – we do need to kind of measure and know where the money is going. So I, I guess what we, what we, the, the work that we're, we're trying to do is not to replace this existing model because we understand there is a need for it and that, you know, there's a need for it to be reported and the need for it to be accountable. So certainly if it's public money, you, you need some sort of accountability. But what we are trying to do is actually change the conversation from this language of measurement to uh, using evaluation as learning. So it feels like a missed opportunity because this idea of evaluation, right, it's something that as designers do all the time. We don't call it evaluation. We just call it prototyping, you know. So um, we, what struck us was that actually what the practitioners were doing was they're doing this all the time. They're like kind of reflecting, they're co-designing, they're prototyping with the community. and But then that's not calling it or framing it as evaluation because it's not recognized by um, people who potentially are not involved at, at the kind of delivery level that is, you know, part of yeah. learning about the project and, do, you know, giving better outcomes. So that's kind of one of the reasons, one of the sort of um, challenges of, of this, this topic, really. This, there is a gap between how we... Uh, evaluate uh, and learn versus the way people expect us to report yes. success. And, exactly. Uh, what ha have you found ways to sort of uh, bridge the gap or bring these two worlds closer together? Because that seems like a really tough mm -hmm. challenge. Yeah, we're doing it in a number of ways. So we obviously spoke to the we, we we ran a dedicated event through this network that i that i lead with my colleague yoko kama and rmit so we set up this network called the designing social innovation asia pacific did that's yeah for short and we gathered together the practitioners on, on a number of events um in asia pacific uh, to a understand how they evaluate their own work um, and learn from that and, and also to, to kind of have conversations about how they see the role of evaluation and what, what it does. And a lot of the work that, that we've done come, is come from that kind of discussion. So we derive this, this series of um, principles and framing. And then we, we also felt that it was really important to talk to funders because that is the gap. So the practitioners, you know, told us the challenges um, but the funders, like, well, how would they respond? So we ended up having a workshop with the funders, um, uh, and we, we, you know, we publicized it as, are you interested in different ways of evaluating? And obviously, they self-selected. But the ones who came, you know, they were ranging from quite large organization, international organization, to small philanthropic um, uh, organizations, and they were aware. They they certainly aware that this is an issue. There is a gap between how they normally do things and actually what happens on the ground. You know, and they're not, not aware, but they, they, they also find challenges, um, same challenges that we encountered. It's legacy. You know, there's a set way that the directors want them to report. Um, they don't have the money to look at these impact longer term. And, um, and, you know, some of them have the agency to change, like a smaller philanthropic organization that we've worked with. They're really keen and they work on what we call what they call it like a trust based uh, relationship which is basically they don't ask for um, project proposals they work with 
partners long term. So if the partners say they need some money to do a project and they say, right, let's have, let's have a conversation rather than submit a proposal and it gets evaluated. So they work in a very different way, but they can because they're smaller. Large organizations have all these structures in place and ways of doing it. So we know there's a, there's a, a recognition, there's a, a challenge, but not the, what we found out is that they didn't really know how to resolve it as well. So, so we, we're, we're having ongoing conversations and then also um, we've been starting to do specific targeted work with organizations. So I've been invited, for example, by um, a team in the Young Foundation in the UK. So the Young Foundation is one of the longest, I guess, not-for-profit organizations delivering, working on delivering social innovation programs in the, the uh, community since the 1950s. So they, they were in, invited to be part of this community driving change program that's funded by the Tower Hamlets Council in London. And the program is really about trying to work with um, residents to um, help them understand uh, things they can improve on their well-being and, and actually help them design interventions to deliver like um, you know, service design type interventions into the community. And they are one of the many providers. So they work with other partners as well. But that team itself in the Young Foundation was really interested in using evaluation to help them learn about the program. So I then did a series of um, workshops and coaching with them and help them just use a, a, an existing platform that they do and uh, mapped onto what they always do anyway, like team stand-ups on a weekly basis, but get them to reflect more formally on this platform um, and note that down and has very specific questions about the project and then to use that reflection to learn and to re refer back to on a weekly and monthly basis. Now, it may not sound like much. It sounds like, oh, that's a really simple solution, but it's already tapping into what they're doing, but making it a bit more thoughtful and a bit more kind of, um, you know, recorded. And that sort of helped them within a short space of time, they can sort of see um, the benefit of that. So they can see what they reflect on, um, what action they needed to do on a short term, but maybe perhaps longer term. And there's also, um, pleasingly, you know, the, the program manager said that, you know, he's, he's able to go into these reflections and pull out some key understanding, key insights that he can put into the quarterly rep reporting that they, they have to do. So pleasingly, it's not just helping them learn about the project and improve as they go along. It's also feeding into the more formal type of reporting. Mm. So that's th that's been a few ways in how we're trying to approach this huge challenge. So what I hear you saying is uh, that one, maybe we as designers need to take more time to uh, capture our learnings and formalize them and make them tangible. I think we like to think on our feet and really quickly mm. incorporate our learnings into the next action we take. So we, we I think we like to do things fast-paced and formalizing and capturing things feels like it's slowing us down and we sort of overlook the benefits or the value of uh, making things sensible. I think documentation is a big challenge in uh, uh, service design for sure. There is so little documentation. There is so there are so little known and well documented case studies. For example, I'm curious. Like, can you give a few more tangible examples of things that you've encountered that maybe service designers are already doing, uh, but not realizing that they could use those actions to use it as reporting? Yeah, so, I mean, basically, um, what they're already doing on a kind of weekly basis, I guess, in terms of their own reflection. So we asked, so one of the exercises we gave the practitioners in the workshop was to ask them to reflect on the way they uh, evaluate the work, but on three different scales. So the scale of it being a personal scale. So how do you reflect on what you've done and what has worked and what hasn't worked? And then you have the team scale. So how do you as a team uh, catch up on things and learn and, and work out, okay, we've done this, this 
has worked, but this hasn't quite worked. So, so that's kind of the middle scale. And then the larger scale, which is, okay, working, evaluating with the, the, the stakeholders and all the other partners and the community. So that's the, the larger scale is the, the more formal evaluation that uh, our practitioners are used to or used to be asked to do. But they, you know, what was really interesting and what, what didn't surprise us was that there were lots of things they were doing at the personal and team-based level. So things like on the personal level, keeping notes, keeping diaries, keeping sketches, keeping audio recording. You know, after you're driving back from a workshop, you might just chat and say, you know, this is my quick reflection or, you know. Um, and then at the team level, you'd, you know, if you work in Agile where you'd, you, you'd have stand-ups, you have daily stand-ups, you have weekly stand-ups, and... Um, and then you might have team meetings, but of course it's, you're not captured it. You're not capturing everything at once, but you might have some notes that you make. Uh, you might have photographs. You might have um, team documentation, etc. So, so all these things are already part of a designer's process. What perhaps isn't so obvious is that how you you use that to maybe assign some some reflection time. So we use. Kolb's sort of uh, reflective um, action learning cycle. So you don't just describe what just happened. You you try to understand why has that happened the way it did? Uh, how do I feel about it? And then actually what, what I want to change about it. And that it's so it's very action orientated, which fits design to the T anyway, but is much more explicit. And, you know, when you have those little action points, you want to do this, this and that. That can be logged and taken into the team meeting and say, so I've I've had this issue with so and so and and the community wasn't quite responding the way I wanted to, so I've just tweaked the, the the methods and the tools that I use and tried it again. So but then you can sort of see and have a track of these action points as we go along. So just by having and that's what that's I think hopefully is working with the Young Foundation team, the CDC team, because we were aware we didn't want to to, to ask the team to do any more additional work that they already have to do. You know, they're already time poor. Um, but so the the reflection of diaries that we ask them to do is not long, which it's just like four questions. Um, and sometimes they were also interested in like who do you speak to? Um, how many people have you spoken to in the community? Um, what were the reactions? So it was also a way to log the the range of people they've spoken to and and who they perhaps might have missed out on need to talk. So it was helpful for a number of things, revealing these things that is often very implicit in the practitioner, but not logged. And if you think about someone who then has to write a report at the end of the project, they need to have access to these things or they to be able to kind of tell the story but all if all the story they can tell is some service blueprints or personas and then the you know the beautifully designed product services it it doesn't quite it tells artifacts it doesn't tell stories and i think that's the important thing about uh, understanding social impact mm. <laughs> sorry um what I've been um, hearing in your story and what I recognize from my own practice is that uh, a lot of the value is in the process. And mm -hmm. uh, the big mistake we tend to make is to sort of just only document the outcome, uh, like you said, the artifact, mm -hmm. while a lot yeah. of the value is created in the process, in the learning, and there are you need different ways to capture that. You, you do not capture that in a single drawing mm -hmm. or a single blueprint um and that's what i'm hearing you describing capturing the value that's created throughout the story throughout the process is that correct yeah i think so um and it's not just for the benefit of capturing it and then obviously being able to celebrate the success uh with the funder but it's more important to celebrate success with the community it's also about understanding what the community values so you're working with the stakeholder working with sorry so service users for example so using this if it's a service design project what do they value what do they values impact for the work that you've done um the client may have a very specific outcome they want to achieve but actually the value that has been been given to someone who's just by making their life a lot easier to access uh, tax credit, for example, is it could be enormous, you know, but we, we just see that, oh, how many people have accessed the service, you know, 20% up from last year. Great. Mm. Um, so I think it's also about 
um, celebrating success for the community and also for the practitioners because um, it's not just about, um, I think it's, it's about changing conversation, knowing that what they're doing is evaluation and they're not asked to do something additional that they're not not familiar with or they have to do, you know, they always, I always tend to think, oh, I have to do evaluation. Oh, okay, I have to... I have to do an additional work, but actually this isn't additional. It's part of what they do and we do it all the time. But, and actually, if you get them to think about um, impact right from the start of the project, it's really helpful because you're constantly trying to think, well, how would this impact on this, this, these criteria that I'm trying to aim for? So it's actually quite helpful to, to think in that way and to change the, the practice to enrich the practice in this way. So when designers think, okay, it's additional work, I have to evaluate, I have to formalize it, there's probably a reason why this feels like a burden. Is it, mm -hmm. aren't, uh, why aren't they sort of feeling or experiencing the value of uh, their efforts in capturing this? I think because it's often uh, an add-on. <laughs> Right, so we don't. Um, we only have to think about the value of reporting. Perhaps if we maybe I ask uh, to do it by our client, and and we might think, okay, well, we need to put additional resources in. Or if they think evaluation, oh, we need to do some surveys. Or we need to kind of test for these things. And so it does feel like it's an addition to what we already do when we're very much about you know, delivering or designing a service and, and you know, offering. So, but I think it's this, this, I go back to this thing about changing and framing, not just for the funders point of view, but from the practitioners, this idea of evaluation, that it's not measurement, it's learning. And we do that all the time. So if we can just find something in the, in what we already do and, um, maximize it, leverage on it. So for example, the notes that you do and the, the, the team meetings that you have. And if you just have one agenda items around what have we learned uh, that, that will, to the project that might help improve the outcome of the, of the project. And that little line could then be used to help build that story of the evaluations. You see, I mean, it's just small little things, but surfacing that and then noting that down and, Whoever's the, whoever's then responsible for bringing the story together doesn't feel like they have to like recreate mm. that story. It's just there. And I think you touched upon a very important point here. Um, you have to do something with the things that you formalize. So if there yeah. isn't a moment where you come together with a group and reflect on your learnings and adopt that back into your practice, then it does feel like a burden because... You're putting yeah. time and effort into documenting something that's just there for the history books rather than something that you actually get benefit from. So that 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 additional step of using it is is I mm -hmm. think the crucial key here. Yeah, and I think the this that's why this thing about learning. So using those those notes that you made to say, well, well, that didn't go very well. That meeting, we presented the ideas, and you know the the stakeholder, the, the users didn't really respond well. Why? Why didn't they? Did they simply not like what we presented, or did we present it in a different framing? And then you, or was it? Were we completely off the mark? So you use that and to to say, right, okay, what's the next step? What we're going to approve? What we're going to move forward with? So it it is very much a reflective a reflective practice. It's action oriented. You're not just pontificating, you know, saying, well, why didn't that work? And you know, oh, you know, the world doesn't understand us. But actually, you you need to then turn that into actions that you can test or try out a prototype, and then you move on. So it's very much about yeah, it's it's not an additional thing. It shouldn't feel like it. But because of all these the history behind it, the legacy, um, mm. and this idea of, you know, design always having to prove its value feels a bit like there's always a negative perception to it. Mm. So, yeah, because it's it's it used to be externally driven. You're doing it for mm -hmm. somebody else rather than for yeah. yourself. And I also think like um, if you look at the double diamond, which I have uh, some issues with, 
like evaluation <laughs> or the, the meta level, like learning from your actual process, it's not visualized in the way design processes are often uh, represented. And that sort of also gives misguides people like we're just moving forward. We're just moving yeah. forward without uh, incorporating evaluation or reflective thinking or critical thinking in our approach to actually uh, move faster, you know, get more progress. So it's 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 also just a lack of how we have communicated about the design process so far. Most definitely. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to... Um, imbue in our students, you know, at undergrad and master's level is how are you going to evaluate your work? How do you know it's worked? And they're like, oh, I'll just, I'll just do a survey. <laughs> just like, or I, I might observe, I'll, t- I'll get a few friends to test out the system. And okay, sometimes is as much as they can do. But I think, so this idea of like, actually, and also evaluation doesn't just happen at the end. It happens at every stage, right? So, but I mean, it's also our fault. We just never, as a as a practice, really talked about it. And it's not the sexy end, is it? I mean, we're like, oh well. And sometimes the ego gets in the way because you think ah, it's going to work because I know it is going to work. Trust um, the process. Yeah, that's yeah, what we trust say. the process. That, yeah, that's what we and say. So, so I think, I think it's partly, uh, you know, the the discipline, the pra- practitioners need to also pick up on this um as educators we are trying to pick up on it but it's not often that easy because students are still trying to learn how to be designers before they even want to evaluate right so uh, but we evaluate as tutors we evaluate they were all the time so we want to we we want to emphasize that um as well as changing the language and model that um you know funders are using so it's it's kind of a many prong Mm. issue yeah I, I think, uh, and I'm not a trained designer by any means, but from what I understood from uh, a design field like graphic design, design critique is an uh, sort of integrated part of the graphic design process, or maybe it used to be. And I don't hear almost any conversation about design critiques within a, a field like like service design. And I'm curious why why we've never adopted a practice like that, which I think would be extremely beneficial mm. for, for everybody. Yeah, that's interesting, I guess, because my background is graphic design and I, I, know I moved into digital design and then interaction design, service design, almost because I, cross, you know, I can see the, the, the benefit of applying design thinking across different ways of doing things. Um, yeah, I don't really know, actually. I mean... I, I guess it does might I mean it probably still does happen at certainly at education service design courses I know they when students present the ideas there is a level of critique there and you know discussion um, but whether that happens in practice I you know I haven't really worked professionally as a service designer in an agency I've always done it in a kind of research academic context in which you're always trying to actually work out what you're doing is is actually helpful or useful mm. and and there's an added incentive to also want to write about it because we need to publish so this idea of actually um, going back and reporting on what's 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 worked to a certain extent we have added incentive but if you're a i mean i have worked as a as a professional designer and i know from that experience you don't have time you go from one project to another you don't have time to reflect and sit oh how did that project go you know not even just reporting externally it's just within the team you're just on with it you don't have time to sit and reflect so i think it's also about the the practitioners well talking about it uh, talk about it with the client and even just saying that and planning it in in their costings just very simple things um and 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 i think it's going to be a really important part of it has to be mentioned because I think more and more of these pr- services are, you know, you need designers to understand the, the the business value, the value of it to businesses. So they need to be able to defend that. So let's go back to that conversation because uh, uh, we sort of, uh, I th- we, we need to uh, still address that because at some point you are going to run into the person who's uh, managing the Excel sheet. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, like, have you found ways 
to open the conversation with people who have that kind of mindset. Like we're all about uh, success will change. It's emergent. We don't know uh, what will happen. Uh, and then there is somebody who needs to manage an Excel sheet. Like how do we successfully open a conversation with somebody who's in their, in that position? I think you try to sell it to them in the sense that ultimately, if we adopt evaluation as learning, it will lead to better outcomes. And that could be better financial outcomes or, or better social outcomes or, you know, and they're linked. So it isn't, it's almost like, you know, why wouldn't you do it if it's, and if you can say, look, it's not going to, it's not going to. Uh, cost us an, an additional not a huge amount of additional time we're already tapping into what designers are already doing we're just formalizing a little bit and if we can use for example the stand-up meetings and we record it or we do a quick recording at the end to say these four points what happened uh, how we felt what we've learned what we're going to change right so and that we can take that forward to the next meeting and so I think I would argue it from the point of is already there. It's not like an additional thing we have to do. We might have to enhance it to capture it and be more mindful of 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 talking about it in our day to day practices and keeping an eye on that. Um, but ultimately, it will then lead to better outcome. And when we then say to our client, we are able to. Uh, see the value, not just the value that you've defined, but also the value such as da 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 in this way. You know, it's it makes for a better story, a better um, outcome reporting that you can feed back to the to the client. Really, yeah. Um, yeah and, the, and the challenge still remains: like if we are creating value that's not being uh, appreciated. Like uh, when it's not being captured in the Excel sheet, it might be value that we find valuable, but if the people mm -hmm. who are in positions, uh, who are in the decision-making positions, we still, we will always keep this challenge, right? If, if we're saying, okay, but the community is happier and healthier, uh, but there isn't uh, uh, a square in the Excel sheet to actually express that, like, that's, I think, the, the, the bridge we somehow need to get to show, to educate or to co-create yeah. new ways of capturing value. Yeah, I mean, certainly. we. I think the the key is not to, and I, I use this in my reflection, you know, not to dance to someone else's tune, but to, to create your own tune and to invite others to join in, right? So I think if you advocate and if you can show and yeah some things just don't fit in the excel sheet and we we should recognize that they are they're not just one way of doing things in this world and we rec we know that if we do that it's it's led to what we have now which is kind of you know environmental disaster uh, global pandemic and uh, you know uh, 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 falling economies so this there's not one way and we know this one way of working doesn't work and this kind of so we have to kind of acknowledge that, yes, you can view the world through an Excel sheet, but it's limited. And if you want to um, do other things with it and look at other kind of outcomes, impact, you need other ways of doing it. And I think they can coexist. I'm not saying we should replace one or the other. I think the key is this idea that you can hold multiple views in your hand and not be like completely confused and they'll, you have a meltdown, right? But not many people can. We take it for granted that, um, you know, uh, I can, you, you can see different multiple approaches to it. Um, I think it's about, I wouldn't say replacing, it's just bringing them closer or bringing it closer to each other and say they, they complement and they support each other. Um, I still don't think the Excel sheet should dominate. And we need to split it, it does, around. Right? But that's it, the reality. I know, I know it does. That, that's I know the, it does. That's the reality. At some point, uh, in ninety nine percent of the organizations, like there, at some point, there is the Excel sheet that wants to have three. That has a three month horizon or a six month horizon, and then yeah. that's the struggle. Uh, 
we face one is that the impact we create is hard to quantify and it's long term and those are two things that sort of clash really hard with the way impact is represented within uh, uh, at least profit organizations and maybe also uh, uh, yeah. not for profit yeah i i it's you know we're, we're we're limited to this construct which is yearly budgets uh reporting um the length of a project which has a start and end point i mean i argue that the way design set up so much focus on a project um uh, is is problematic because a lot of the work that's done in, in social innovation is so long term and when you intervene you're just part of the part of that you know at, at a certain point in the timeline and then when you extract yourself they're still there so you need to be able to make sure that whatever you intervene you're then leaving behind you know capacity or tools and resilience so that they can they can sort of carry on right so um certainly the models in which we our practice is set up doesn't quite fit but it's also because we're having to fit in with the way the world is set up, the the business world, or the for, 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 even for nonprofits, they have their own way of doing things. You know, it is a yearly cycle. You've got a budget, you need to set spend it, and then we don't know whether that's going to be progress. Um, and I mean, there's no. I mean, I'm not. I'm not offering a silver bullet here, but I think what's actually important is to recognize it is a problem, and that to just have that conversation and as practitioners to to uh first of all think about it in terms of how they're evaluating the practice so that they can see the benefits of themselves then secondly how do you communicate and and convince the the money man that it is of benefit i think i think there is hope because um we were having these conversations people are talking to us they want us to support them they're reading out the resources that we we're offering so they it chimes with them so they recognize the challenge they just don't know how to, to solve it like many of us because we're so tied into the systems we're in but they're taking you know like even the work i'm doing with young foundation they're just taking small steps but that's better than nothing sure. and they're seeing you know improvement at the kind of practice level and they can also see better reporting to the funders that's that was a surprising thing because the program manager's like oh yeah i can read through all the diaries and then i can really gain some insights rather than have you know, at the end of the project, have a long meeting and work out. So what what came out of that, you know, mm. so. Yeah, you, one key area here is that we also have to uh, accept and, and be proud of that the way we express impact through stories, through narratives, uh, is a valid way to mm. show evidence. And I think we are, in a lot of cases... Uh, intimidated by the quantitative data mm. and uh, sort of back down on our ways of uh, showing impact. And step one would be to agree with ourselves that we are not going to marginalize the ways of presenting impact that we have. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think we need to obviously get smarter with uh, understanding the data that comes out of quantitative stuff and and but also call out its limitation you know be, not be afraid to call it its limitation and say well it doesn't tell us this it doesn't tell us that but we know like on the ground when we speak to the community and we work with them we can see these changes yeah. um and it's it feels great and i want to share it and how best to share it. and there are, there, are, there are methods i'm not saying there isn't methods they're like you know we're using we're, we're, we're using a method called developmental approach, which is quite well established in Canada and Australia. And it's actually, it's about this idea of using evaluation as learning. And it's an approach. It's not like a set of toolkits, a method. You can, uh, you can use anything, you can combine them, but it's about this idea of using it learning and it's iteratively, it's a cycle. So it, it marries really well with the design process, you know? And so there, there are already tools out there, even just um, methods like um, stories of significant change. So you ask the community what's the most significant change. You collect that, and it comes through as quotes, or it comes through as stories. And I think we should really give prominence to those rather than, you know, the kind of Excel data that comes out and go, oh yeah, 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 that's great. I know it's easy to report on, but it's a bit lazy on our part if we don't maximize 
the other side of the, yeah. the yeah. kind of messiness of it. And right. and I think again, uh, you sort of mentioned something which is really important: a way to uh, present the value of the way we show impact is by showing mm -hmm. the limitations of a, sort of the traditional ways. So there are countless of examples where things were measured. Um, correctly and sh showed uh, a positive ROI, but in the end, the effect was disastrous. Um, mm. And I think that uh, Trisha Wang, who was recently on the show, she talks about th uh, thick data versus big data. Like you can have all the big data you want, but if that doesn't give you the insights to act upon it, like it's, it's useless. Yeah. So I think those kind of narratives, we also need to develop and be smarter about... Uh, showing the contrast and also showing like, okay, if you want to have big data, then probably I'm not the right person. If you want to have thick data and you want to have qualitative insights that will lead you to this, I'm your man. Uh, and I think we need more convincing and smarter examples there. Yeah, most definitely. I think, um, you know, data is, as you say, you know, big data can be dumb data if, if it's interpreted the wrong way. And it's all about the interpretation. So, uh, but you do need data. It has to be data driven, but you need to be smart with how the data is interpreted and what data. So, importantly, what data you're collecting as well. You know, sometimes it just spend a lot of money, resources collecting the wrong data. And it's just, you know, it, yeah. it's just wasted resources. And so I think we, we need definitely to be smart about that to call out. But I think I think as designers, you need to take ownership of it. I think that's the key as well, you know, because you might maybe in traditional design education, you're not really taught to think about impact or evaluate the work apart from some user testing and you're like, okay. But not really think actually how might this really impact and, and here we move on to this discussion around kind of the ethics of of, of design and you know bigger bigger topical issues right and responsibility as a designer but i still don't think as a as a discipline we we take we we take ownership of these um aspects as much as we just don't maybe consider it as part of our our tools our toolkits you know yeah. we're good at yeah. idea generation and only recently we're like okay we can do some design research yeah we can do that and and, and then we can use that to come up with ideas and we can prototype it and we can present it. Um, but then the evaluation bit is like, oh, that's for someone else's to do, you know, or, or someone at the business side to do. I don't want to be involved. So I think it's also about taking ownership of, of this topic, really. If you would have to, if wh what do you hope is the one thing people will remember from the conversation we just had? Um, that to use evaluation as learning, uh, simple as that, and to not be afraid of it and to not discount it uh, and to take responsibility for it and that they're already doing it. So it's nothing new, but they, they have to simply, so, not simply, but formalize it and think of it as, you know, evaluating the outcomes for the, for the project itself. Yeah, do it. it Consciously and deliberately and formally, that's already would be a huge, huge win. Yeah, yeah. I know you have a lot of material uh, out there for people who want to dive deeper into this. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some good resources to follow up on? Um, I think to read up on this approach that we've um, referring to, the developmental uh, evaluation, um, there's some easy quick guides that i can we can share with the links we've also uh, written a number of reports and papers about the work that we're doing with practitioners um, and we introduce what we call the designing uh, social impact evaluation framework and it's a series of i would say principles in how you might want to think about evaluation as learning and how you might do that in a more practical way um, um, yeah, and and we have um, videos of of um, that we did of the 
of the gathering that we did with the practitioners about impact evaluation, in which they share like the methods and the, the way they're doing things and, and, and some of the challenges that they have. So I think that would be kind of quite rich resource to at least hear from the practitioners themselves and hopefully it chimes with a lot of your listeners. I'll make sure to include all the links in the show notes so people can follow up on. Uh, if people Great. have ideas or questions about this topic, is there a way they can reach out to you? Yeah, feel free to just get in touch with me uh, on LinkedIn or on by email. I don't know well, what you prefer to share. So I'm happy to have conversations um, and just share ideas, really. Awesome. Um, Joyce. I think we've touched upon a super interesting topic. It's definitely a topic that needs uh, more maturity in the coming year. So I hope this is a is a call to action to everybody who's listening to <laughs> think about it, work with it, uh, design design it. Um, and I want to thank you for bringing this to the attention on uh, on this episode. That's great, Mark. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this work. Um to a wider audience because it's been mainly you know residing in the academic world and i think it's although we've been talking to practitioners i think it's really important um especially for designers who are you know moving to space of social design and social innovation changing systems and processes and people we are making impact um, and we are making or delivering social impact we just need to make sure that it's the right type and that it fulfills you know it does deliver benefits to the community that you're trying to, to, to serve really. So um, I, I am, it's definitely a, a topic I'm passionate about and um, I would love to hear from any of your listeners about their experiences and, and anything else that we can share and discuss. So thank you. What's your biggest takeaway from this conversation with Joyce? Leave a comment down below and let us know. If you made it all the way here, you're apparently enjoying these conversations. So make sure to click that subscribe button so you won't miss any new episode in the future. Thanks a lot for watching and I look forward to see you in the next episode.